Norm, we're going to jump into what I call the rapid fire questions. All right, let's do it. Um, when did you first know you wanted to be a lawyer? Probably not until I was practicing. Uh, honestly, um, I started out at the Attorney General's office and had incredible opportunities there and realized that not only um, was the profession being a lawyer um, great and I really enjoyed it, but I could tell there were business opportunities and ways to be an entrepreneur and be a lawyer. So, so I got to ask then, why did you go to law school if you didn't know you wanted to do it in the first place? Uh, because I couldn't cut it in engineering school and I ended up with a political science major. There you go. That's kind of a common tale, I guess. Um, do you have a favorite attorney, group of attorneys, firm to uh, litigate against? Well, we're, we're fortunate in Kansas City. We have a great bar for the cases that we have locally. Um, I think uh, it's one of the benefits of being in the Midwest is everybody knows each other and people behave because you're repeat customers and in front of the judges repeatedly. Um, outside of Kansas City, um, we've obviously litigated quite a bit against King and Spalding in Atlanta in the data breach world. And um, we've been able to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, so that's one firm that comes to mind, at least with my current docket. In your opinion, what has been uh, the biggest change to the class action litigation landscape over the previous five years? Well, I'd probably go back to something I said before, and that's cases taking longer and more likely to go to trial. I think. Uh, either defense strategy or, or corporate uh, defendants think that uh, they have better opportunities if they push the cases to trial, more, more chances either to delay payday um, or get issues on appeal uh, after trial. Right. So a lot of it you think is uh, preserving issues for appeal and more opportunities for, uh, for plaintiff's counsel to put their foot in their mouth and do something silly? Absolutely. There's, uh, there's opportunity for, uh, for failure and um, um, trying a case and getting it through a jury verdict, uh, post-trial motions and appeal. Those are all additional hurdles from the more traditional ones, which are challenges on the front end of a case, on motions to dismiss and summary judgment and class certification. What's your favorite non-legal movie? Oh, it's The Graduate. Um, loved it when I first saw it. It's the, uh, I think it has the best story and still the best uh, movie soundtrack of all time. Soundtrack's fantastic. I will, I, will, I will argue that either Forrest Gump or The Big Chill should be in the conversation around soundtrack, but, but I agree with you. Th those, are fair, those are fair contributions to the soundtrack leaderboard, but I'll still take uh, The Graduate. What about legal movie? Do you have a favorite legal movie? I know it's I know it's what everyone says, but it's my cousin Vinny. Yeah, how could it not be? Right? I just uh, you know I just came across it maybe two weeks ago as I was uh, <laughs> sitting on the couch and watched it almost from the beginning, and it's it's awesome. I thought you meant you just came across it for the first time and you were being facetious. No, no, no. I just uh, channel flipping came across it, Got and it. and there's so many great parts of that movie that really inform how to be a good trial lawyer. That um, I, I just smile every time I see it. Oh, that's a great one. Do you have a particular book that you like to give as a gift to people? I used to give uh, Freakonomics. Um, uh, we we like that book in our firm a lot. We talk about it. Um, the Malcolm Gladwell books also. I, I think it the the books like Freakonomics that and the way Malcolm Gladwell approaches issues. Um, I think is how we like to approach our practice, which is don't look at it from the perspective. Uh, that everybody else brings to that practice. And um, I think it served us well. On the same note, I read a lot of Jonah Berger, I read a lot of Kahneman, and they're both, um, I don't know if you read either of those guys. A little bit, yes. Yeah, the, you'd enjoy it. Well, I think it's, I think your firm is, is similar in that um, you came to a business that I think many lawyers viewed as, as fungible and, and said, how can we do this differently? How can we do it better? And you guys have done a great job doing just that. I appreciate that. What was your least favorite law school class? Oh, that's easy. That was property. Um, I, I thought it was going to have to drop out of law school my, my first year um, managing the rule in Shelley's case. Very difficult. The rule against perpetuities. But you did get really fun terms like the fer fertile octogenarian was one I always liked. Yes, that, that was a good one. That I was always thought it would be a great college band name, the fertile octogenarian. I think that's good. I think that's good. <laughs> I suspect I'll probably know the answer to this one, but uh, what do you see as sort of the biggest growth area in class action law? Well, um, certainly from my world today and in 2019, it's data breach, um, and I think that trend will continue. Uh, there's um, uh, an increase of, um, of cases um, basically every quarter in the data breach world. 
Um, companies have not gotten their act together, and there is still no uniform statutory scheme that companies are governed by. Um, and the United States is behind. Um, and eventually, perhaps, we'll catch up, but it doesn't look like that'll happen anytime soon. Which case was worse for the plaintiffs bar? Carrera, Concepcion, Dukes, or Spokio? Well, I think time has, has shown that um, Concepcion is probably at the top of the list, and, and cases that have been subsequent to that. The, the issue related to um, arbitration and how that impacts uh, consumers' rights, I think, has been uh, devastating. Um, I have um, numerous examples of cases that um, were legitimate cases that we could not get off the ground because of an arbitration clause. Yeah. Uh, and I think um, the more people are educated about that, the more people that meet a stiff wall when they realize that their rights have essentially been usurped, um, perhaps over time that will soften, but it's, that has proven to be brutal. Yep, it's a common refrain. Yeah. Do you have a particular nonprofit that's uh, important to you? Well, my favorite nonprofit is the Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City. I was uh, asked to serve uh, on the board when that foundation was formed about uh, 10 years ago. I became its chairman, um, and it was a foundation formed with the sale of a hospital chain called Health Midwest in Kansas City uh, that generated about a $500 million um, uh, foundation and um, participating outside of the uh, legal world in delivering health care to the underserved in my community was was by far yeah, the the best thing I've done uh, outside the outside the legal world yeah that's amazing I imagine it's super gratifying yeah definitely would you advise the next generation your daughter to go to law school it's a tricky question Steve <laughs> I have two daughters, and um, neither of them have expressed the, the least bit of interest in going to law school, and um, that's okay with me. I think, um, I think people really uh, ultimately should go to law school if they want to be a lawyer and they know they want to be a lawyer, so unlike me. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a difficult world out there for, for young lawyers, and I think um, we probably had 10 years of too many people going to law school for the wrong reasons. I agree with that. What is, in your opinion, the most beautiful courthouse in the United States? Well, it's one I saw for the first time about two weeks ago when I was traveling to Portland. Uh, the federal courthouse um, that has been um, redone um, in downtown Portland is uh, absolutely fantastic. It is uh, unique among federal courthouses, in my experience, having seen scores of them around the country. And I would encourage anybody in Portland to stop by the federal courthouse downtown. Now, I've heard that a number of times recently, how magnificent it is. I want to see it. I haven't seen it. It's, it's really quite something. They've preserved it to its 150-year-old uh, splendor. Wow. Last question. If you had one piece of advice to impart on the younger generation of lawyers, someone just coming up, third, fourth, fifth year associate, what would you tell them that you would think would make a meaningful difference in their life? Well, from the practice of law standpoint, it's uh, get in the courtroom. Um, I think young lawyers, if they can financially, um, should do whatever they can to get in the courtroom, which usually means working for public defender's office, attorney general's office, uh, take every single opportunity you can to just test your skills in the courtroom. That's the only way, uh, ultimately, you learn how to do it. Um, so that's definitely, from a legal perspective, the advice I would give young lawyers. Do you have anything you want to share from the non-legal perspective? Some sage words of wisdom? My, the sage words of wisdom is have a life outside of your, outside of your job. Uh, being a lawyer can be very challenging and stressful, and you absolutely need to have uh, outlets outside of the practice to, uh, to have a long career. It's great. Norm, thanks again. This was great. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it.